It's so good to be here. What a privilege to meet so many of you as I've kind of wandered around before we've gotten going here. And it's such a joy to hear about your, your ministries and your local churches. And I'm so encouraged to be among you and learn from you and hear about what God is doing in your churches. It'll be a joy as well to hear from my fellow presenters and learn from their good content. So I'm right here with you wanting to make progress in knowing Christ and becoming like him. It is certainly a very wintry Minneapolis afternoon. I am feeling that acutely as someone from Memphis, Tennessee, but it really is a joy to be here with you all talking about word ministry among women in the local church. In a moment, I'll open Colossians 3.16, and we'll see how this text tells us about word ministry in general, and then we'll consider what that means for us, for our word ministry among women in the local church. Now, provided that I get through our content at a rapid pace, uh, we'll have time at the end for a few questions from you all. Um, but regardless of whether or not I successfully work through our content, I'll be here afterwards. I'd love to answer any particular questions you have. I'd also love for you to share your wisdom with me about the ministry among women in your local church. I'd love to learn from you. So please do feel free to come and, and fill me in. Well, let me get started by defining one of our key terms today. You're going to hear uh, me use the phrase, Word filled ministry or word ministry among women in the local church. Since you'll hear me use that phrase a lot, I figured I might as well let you in on what I mean by it. <laughs> when I talk about word ministry among women, I'm not merely referring to formal women's Bible studies, large groups and small groups. Of course, word ministry among women includes Bible studies, formal gatherings, but it includes more than that. When I say word ministry among women in the local church, I'm referring to the various ways that God's word is at work among us. The various ways that we women study God's word, practice God's word, putting into practice what we hear, and then communicate God's word with others. Women in our local churches represent a wide variety of callings and contexts. And graciously, God's word equips us in every single one of them. Sometimes word ministry among women in a local church happens formally and programmatically. But often, word ministry among women happens informally and organically. Two women sitting around a kitchen table with their Bibles open. Two friends texting each other encouragement from God's word. A woman sharing wisdom from God's word with her non-Christian friends at the gym. This is word ministry among women. Among my local church sisters, I see the word at work in a variety of ways, a wide variety of ways. I recently joined my local church's uh, staff team. I've, I've been um, a part of our local church's staff team for four months, and I haven't been fired yet. So everything is looking good. That's right. Woohoo! Thanks be to God. That's called a miracle. Uh, it has been such a joy to join this staff team. And because I'm new to this staff team, to ministering among women in the local church, I thought, you know what I'm going to do for my first four months? I'm going to meet with as many sisters as I can in this congregation from different generations, backgrounds, calling, ministry focuses, life stages. I'm just going to meet with as many women as I can in this congregation to get to know them better and also to hear from them about their needs and their desires. It's been a real privilege to meet with these women. And let me tell you one thing that has been crystal clear from my meetings. Women in my congregation are carrying heavy burdens. Emotional and psychological burdens, physical burdens relating to their health or the health of those they love, financial burdens, spiritual burdens. They're facing heavy burdens. And let me tell you something. So am I. <laughs> We're struggling against the world, the flesh, and the devil. What my sisters have graciously let me in on as they've shared with me has heightened my sense of urgency about the importance of vibrant, vital word ministry among women in the local church. We're facing serious challenges. And so we need serious refreshment and serious equipping. 
Perhaps some of us here in this room right now are acutely aware of our need for serious refreshment and serious equipping. In this broken and sinful world east of Eden, and with this broken and sinful flesh, we need nothing less than God himself. We need God's spirit to apply his personal speech to his people in which he tells us about his son, the word made flesh. To, to borrow language from the Apostle Paul, we need those sacred writings which are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Because we recognize that these writings are breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the, the man, the, the messenger of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So, in view of the seriousness of our common mission, and in view of the peculiar power of God's word to equip us for this common mission, there's one question that I want each of us to consider here today. And answering this question is going to require from us a little sanctified imagination. Here's the question. What might it look like for God to grow your word ministry and the word ministry among women in your local church? What might it look like for God to grow your word ministry, strengthen it, mature it, help you make progress, and also grow the word ministry among women in your local church? Talking about growth requires that we make an honest and humble assessment about where we are. <laughs> And we make a humble and honest assessment about where God might be pleased to take us for the glory of his son and the advancement of his kingdom. In this room, we, we represent all kinds of different starting points in terms of our experience and maturity in word ministry. But I'm praying that throughout the course of our time together, each of us will be freshly motivated, <laughs> freshly energized to make progress together to consider where we are and where God might take us all by his power and grace to move from point A to point B. So let's dream a little bit together. <laughs> but before we do that, let's begin by asking God to do what only he can do. Let's pray. Father, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. As we open your word, we ask that you would open our eyes to see your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to help us become more like him. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Well, there's no better way to talk about word ministry than to turn to the word itself. So please turn with me to Colossians 3.16. That's Colossians 3.16. Paul sends this letter to the local church at Colossae, a congregation of men and women and children representing a wide variety of socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. In Paul's final greetings in, in Colossians, he instructs the Colossians to circulate this letter among the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. That means that we have explicit warrant for seeing Paul's particular instruction in 316 to the Colossian church as having a broader application uh, for other congregations. So Colossians 316, the apostle Paul exhorts the church at Colossae, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In this verse, Paul touches on four basic elements of word ministry. The what, the who, the how, and the why. The what of word ministry, the who of word ministry, the how of word ministry, and the why of word ministry. So let's briefly unpack together each of these elements, asking God to help us envision what progress he might encourage us to make in word ministry. So first, the what of word ministry. And we see right from the start that the ministry of the word is a Christ-centered calling. Not a teacher-centered calling, not a hearer-centered calling, a Christ-centered calling. The ministry of the inscripturated word 
centers on the person and work of Christ, the incarnate word. Look again with me at Colossians 3.16. It's the word of Christ that we let dwell in us richly. What is this word of Christ? (laughs) Well, it's the word about Christ and the word that comes from Christ. And this word of Christ is to find its home in us, as one translation renders it. This word is to take up residence among us personally and corporately. Now, now turn back with me for just a moment, a couple pages to Colossians 1.28. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, Paul describes his own apostolic word ministry. And he refers to the Lord Jesus Christ when he writes in verse 28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. We see here that Paul's apostolic ministry had everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's proclaiming Christ. Now, how does Paul do this? Well, we know from from the book of Acts and from Paul's other epistles that he's constantly reasoning with people from the scriptures. (laughs) That is, from the Old Testament, He's showing how all of God's promises find their yes in the person and work of Christ. Paul's trying to persuade the saints to see Christ as the fulfillment of God's promises. As he writes in chapter 1, verse 26, he's aiming to persuade his hearers that the gospel of Christ is the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to the saints. So, bearing this in mind, let's each of us think about our word ministry and the word ministry among women in our local church. What might it look like for God to grow us in Christ-centeredness? How might we make progress in understanding and explaining the person and work of Christ, including how God has decisively fulfilled his promises in Christ? There is a great deal to say here, (laughs) and I'll just make a couple comments, just beginning to touch on the matter. The crucial starting point, of course, is that we read our Bibles day by day, and that as we read our Bibles, we meditate deeply on this word of Christ. As believers, when we behold Christ in his glory, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Some of my friends who are moms of little ones tell me how challenging it is to read the Bible day by day, but they also tell me how vital it is to their ministry in the home. They, they tell me about how they put God's Word on their iPod or put it in the CD player just to listen to God's Word, just being sure that even just for 10 minutes a day in those difficult seasons, they're daily meditating on the Scriptures and contemplating the Word of Christ, His person and work. So along with reading our Bibles daily, it's also helpful to to read books and other materials that show us how God's big story of redemption has climaxed in the first coming of Christ and will will culminate in Christ's second coming. I got some of those letters mixed up. You know, just throw them in a bag, shake them up, pull them out. Lots of material is helpful in this regard, both in print and online. But, But a couple titles come to my mind right now. God's Big Picture by our brother Vaughn Roberts. Uh... Name Above All Names by Alistair Begg and Sinclair Ferguson. The God Who Is There by Don Carson and others. Now, our objective in reading this material isn't merely academic. We want to grow in our understanding of the Christ-centeredness of the Scriptures so that we grow in Christ-centeredness in our daily living. We want to be formed This Christ-centeredness of the what of word ministry is why, I have to be honest with you, I'm not too wild about articulating the main objective of Bible study as biblical literacy. 
We do ourselves no good if we have notebook after notebook filled with facts about Christ when we aren't delighting in Christ personally as the center of our being, the one who holds us together, as Paul says earlier in Colossians, both personally and corporately. Sisters, may may we never settle for biblical literacy as word ministry's ultimate end. Let us press on to know the Lord. So let's shape all our engagement with Scripture, including our local church women's Bible studies, with this relational objective explicitly front and center, this goal of knowing Christ and becoming like Him. And let's pray that we, as those who share God's Word in various ways and various forms, that we find Christ so supremely satisfying that as we let his word dwell richly among us, we rejoice exceedingly with great joy. (laughs) Let's make our women's Bible studies an exercise in corporate joy in Christ (laughs) with thankfulness in our hearts to God. When we engage in word ministry, we proclaim Christ to women by the power of Christ, with joy in Christ for the sake of Christ. It's a Christ-centered calling in every sense. He is the crucial what of word ministry. So we've talked about the what of word ministry. Now let's talk about the who. This is the second element of word ministry that we see in our passage. Now I realize that we've gathered at this conference because those of us here are serious about ministry. But it may still be true that some of us are thinking, okay, okay, I get what you're saying about the essence of word ministry, that it's, that it's a Christ-centered ministry. But are you really saying that that's something for which I'm responsible? I mean, isn't that mainly what my local church pastor does or what that really gifted Bible teacher does? Are you saying that every Christian ought to engage in Christ-centered word ministry? I'm so glad that you asked. Because yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. Let me, let me back that up from, from the text. Let's look at the first part of Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Who is this you and who is this one another? Well, we see in chapter 3 verse 1 that Paul is addressing all the saints, every believer who has been raised with Christ. So Paul issues this command in 316 to the entire congregation without distinction. Word ministry is not only a Christ-centered calling, it's every Christian's calling. Now it is true, and we must say this, that the Apostle Paul and our local church pastors and elders whose ministry is patterned after Paul's apostolic ministry have a distinct and special stewardship from God relating to the ministry of the Word. But Paul's ministry also provides a pattern for all of us, a model for all of us. Please turn again to Colossians 1.28. We'll look at this text again. You'll notice the parallel that Paul uses the same language to describe his word ministry as he does in 3.16 to describe the whole congregation's word ministry. He writes in chapter 1, verse 28, Him we proclaim, warning or admonishing, it's the same word, warning everyone and teaching everyone. We see the parallel here, don't we, between 128 and 316. So none of us is off the hook. Other biblical texts are helpful in this regard. They they show us that every Christian is called to word ministry. Titus 2, for example, a passage with which many of us are familiar. Titus 2 deals directly with word ministry among women in the local church. I'm going to break some parts of this down for us. Wonderfully, this passage in Titus 2 also helps clarify the relationship between our pastors and elders' word ministry and word ministry among women. In his letter to Titus, Paul is urging Titus to bind together good doctrine and good works and to make sure in every aspect of the congregation that good doctrine and good works are bound together. In chapter 2, verse 1, for example, Paul tells Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then in verse 3, Paul charges Titus to oversee vibrant word ministry among women in the church. 
a ministry that displays the good doctrine united with good works. The older women of good character must teach what is good, Paul says. That is, they must teach sound doctrine. <laughs> that which accords with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the scriptures that proclaim him. And as older women teach what is good, Paul, Paul says, they'll train their younger sisters to live out what is good in their various callings and contexts. The good doctrine that these older sisters pass on to their younger sisters, it aims to stir up good works among their younger sisters. That way, as Paul says in verse 5, God's word isn't reviled. So the simple point that I'm trying to make right now for um, the who of word ministry is that Titus's shepherding of the whole flock involves not only his own word ministry, teaching what account, uh, accords with sound doctrine, but also overseeing and promoting a flourishing word ministry among the women of his congregation. Now, the truth is that I could stand up here for hours and tearfully tell you about the many Tituses whom God has been so kind to bring in my life. Those local church pastors and elders who have prayed for me, who have encouraged me, who have warned me, <laughs> who, who have helped equip me in the word and my other sisters in the word. So many brother elders take initiative to serve their sisters this way and, and find joy in the word at work among their sisters. I realize that, that not everyone, maybe even not everyone in this room, may experience the, the kind of blessing and encouragement from the elders at your church. Some of my dearest friends and sisters wrestle against deep discouragement on account of not being valued or supported by their elders. So my positive example is not meant to be glib or blind to the hardships that we face east of Eden. I, t I tell you my positive example because my brother elders, by God's grace, have set an example worth sharing. <laughs> For instance, when my local church elders encouraged me, they, they actually took initiative to encourage me to go to seminary. They saw to it that the whole church helped fund my, my master's degrees and that an older sister in Christ was formally put in place to pray for me, to encourage me, to mentor me. And that relationship continues even today. What a privilege <laughs> to be part of Christ's well-ordered church with Christ himself as our head and savior and with under shepherds who promote vibrant word ministry among their sisters. So these, these passages in Colossians and in Titus, they help us see that, that word ministry isn't reserved for just a few in the congregation. No, it's a privilege that God grants to every Christian in one form or another. Of course, not every believer should, as James tells us in chapter 3, become a formal public Bible teacher. But every follower of Christ has a teaching ministry of some sort or another. Specifically, we're to hand down the scriptures to the next generation. Whether that's to our children or grandchildren or to those whom we disciple. I actually want to take a moment to tell you about a friend of mine who is such an encouragement to me in the ways that she works hard to make progress in her word ministry in her particular field. My 30-year-old-ish something friend, how's that for uh, an adjectival um, description of her age? She's a social worker for whom it's illegal for her to speak of Christ to those she serves unless they ask her a direct question. She mostly works with women and children who are in dire straits. And as she learns more and more about their hardships and their day-to-day -day experiences, she has an increasing sense of urgency to share Christ with them. But it's illegal unless they ask her a direct question. But her burden is only sharpening because she knows that he is the only solution. He is the only one who can meet their needs. So you know what she does? After a long, emotionally draining day of work, she comes home and she opens her Bible. She chooses those texts 
that relate particularly to the situations that have raised up uh, from the women in particular with whom she's uh, encountered. She pours over those scriptures and she prays for her clients. She prays God's word for her clients. And then you know what else she does? <laughs> so beautiful. She invests the hard work and the time and the prayer to work out the main point of those passages. It, there's, it's central thrust. And then she puts it in her own words. And then she prays that God would open a door for the word. And the next day and the next week or however long as she goes and ministers among these women, she's always looking for that open door. And you know, she, she shares in her own words, she shares the wisdom that she's gleaned from God's word. And there have been a few occasions in which one of these women have, have been amazed by her wisdom and they've said, now, how, what, tell me about your source of wisdom. How, how did you get to be so wise? And you know what she calls that? A direct question. <laughs> On several occasions, she's been able to explicitly share, I split my infinitive, she's been able explicitly to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with these women. This is the evangelistic strategy of a woman who believes that God, what God says about the transformative power of his word. Okay, so let's apply this content to, to those of us in this room. Recognizing that word ministry is every Christian's calling and recognizing that word ministry takes on a variety of diverse forms in our various callings and contexts, let's imagine together what might it look like for God to grow our word ministry and the word ministry among women in our local church in more explicitly equipping every female saint for ministering the word and her particular role in life. What might that look like? Here's one example of how we in Memphis are, are trying to, to make progress in this regard in, in terms of explicitly equipping every female saint. In one of our Bible studies, we're studying the epistle of James. I've shaped our curriculum, our study guide, according to three priorities, all of them pointing to the Lord Jesus. Hearing the word, doing the word, sharing the word. Three priorities. So after a woman hears the word, after she meditates on this word of Christ and answers questions about it, then she turns to apply the word, apply uh, God's wisdom to her own life. She finally comes to this third priority, share the word. And in this study guide, she's, she's prompted to write down the name of, of a particular person with whom she'd like to share this word. And she writes down that name. Then she's prompted to consider how she might apply this word to that particular person. Then she's prompted to pray and to write out a prayer, praying that God would open a door for, the, for that word to be shared and praying that God would give her clarity and wisdom to speak it. More explicitly equipping us, that we are coming to be equipped to minister the word. Another thing that I'll say is, as often as possible, as I'm expounding James in our group time, I, I try to highlight how James himself is using the word. He uses the word in such beautifully diverse ways. So even pointing that out helps us stretch our imagination to, to think about all the different ways we can be sharing God according to whatever the context calls for. Often in the beginning of our group time, I open the floor for any woman who would like to give testimony about sharing the word with someone earlier that week, uh, the word that we studied last week. And so we're hoping to encourage each other and pray for one another and learn together. In all of this, we're aiming to be more explicit in our Bible studies about equipping and mobilizing women for discipleship and evangelism. We want to do more than fill up notebooks. We want to see the opportunities that God is giving us all around us to share this word of life. We want to see them. We want God to open our eyes and we want to grow in our confidence that he's given us everything that we need to, to share this word. And we want to grow together as sisters on relying upon Christ to, to, do, to do this. In other words, we want to be among those who make the best use of the time. Okay, we've looked at the what of word ministry, the who of word ministry. We've said that word ministry is a Christ-centered calling. We've said that word ministry is every Christian's calling. But how? How do we do this? Well, to be sure, 
the Apostle Paul has already established for us in chapter 1, verse 29, the most important how. Namely, it's Christ's energy, <laughs> that he's powerfully working in us as we proclaim Christ. Many of us in this room, including me, often feel intimidated when it comes to sharing the word, whether formally or informally. We're acutely aware of our inadequacy. I, I can't tell you how many times I have shared the word with great fear and trembling, in obvious weakness. And yet here, our brother Paul in 129 graciously reminds us that the success of word ministry doesn't rest on us, on our intellect, or our riveting personal testimonies, or even our character. It doesn't rest on us. This word ministry has never been up to us. It, it could never be up to us. Word ministry success is up to God. The very God who spoke a word and the whole cosmos came into existence is the God who equips us to speak his word and to minister it for the glory of Christ. He displays his mighty strength in our weakness. But what else can we learn about the how of word ministry? What can we learn about some of the effective ways of sharing the word? Well, let's look again at Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How? Teaching and admonishing one another. These two words, teaching and admonishing, they represent two ways that the word of Christ takes up residence among believers. It may be here that Paul is especially referring to the mutual teaching and admonition that occurs among God's people through corporate singing in the midst of corporate worship. But even if in this context, Paul is highlighting word-filled singing during corporate worship, we can, we can glean from this passage broader principles for word ministry, especially as we consider this passage's whole Bible context. So how do we minister the word? We teach it. <laughs> we expound the scriptures. We engage in what we often call biblical exposition. Our sister Kathleen Nielsen emphasizes that the word exposition, a fancy word, <laughs> it's simply referring to some kind of public display. She writes, biblical exposition is, at its heart, laying out the word treasures that are there and helping people see them clearly. It's not creating new treasures or decorating the old ones. It's laying out and pointing to the treasures that are there in the passage in the form in which we're given them. That is, passage by passage and book by book within the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. So in biblical exposition, we're, we're aiming to make plain what is there in the scripture passage. And we're letting the Bible itself set our agenda. There are several profitable ways for teaching God's word, but in my view, the entree, <laughs> the steak from where I'm from, the, the entree of a, of a Christian's spiritual meal ought to be expositional study and teaching of the word of Christ. The, the healthiest diet for a growing Christian emphasizes direct study of God's word in its proper context. This usually involves a commitment to, to work through a book of the Bible, passage by passage, always with an eye to that whole Bible story that culminates in the person and work of Christ. For example, if we're serving on a women's ministry team in a local church, we want to gather around God's word as the main thing that we do, even if it's not the only thing that we do. And in our Bible studies, we want women with their Bibles open, not just with a book that they're reading open, but with their Bibles open, digging into the treasures themselves as active learners and sharers. We teach one another. But this element of teaching one another isn't the only thing that Paul shows us here in Colossians 3.16 about the how of word ministry. We also admonish one another or warn one another, as Paul writes in chapter 1. In other words, we also let the word of Christ expound the human heart. <laughs> we teach to the heart of people. We not only set forth what's really there, 
but we consider how what's there really aims to change people. We consider how the text confronts us, refreshes us, calls us to Christ. Now, I'm not contending that in Colossians 3.16 that Paul is exhausting all of the various usage of, uses of Scripture with these two words, teaching and admonishing. But what I am saying is that these two words, teaching and admonishing, they get at two essential aspects of word ministry, and they're integrally connected, teaching and admonishing. We've got to expound the biblical passage, and we've got to take care to understand how that biblical passage expounds the heart and equips us for godliness in our various callings and contexts. And do we notice the manner in which we are to do this? With all wisdom. We teach gently and patiently and meekly and graciously, all in the context of love. So once again, let's consider how all of this lands for us. What might it look like for God to grow the expositional aspect of our word ministry and the word ministry among women in our local church? How might we make progress in expounding the biblical passage and paying attention to how that biblical passage expounds the heart? I'll make three comments, so bear with me. First, Work with your local church leaders to develop a plan for ongoing training in biblical exposition. In Memphis, we're developing two sorts of training. We're developing broad training opportunities available to any woman, as well as more narrow focused training for those women who currently or potentially will lead our word ministry among women. In other words, our Bible teachers. In terms of broad training, here's one example. Next weekend, i got to get ready for it. Next weekend, we'll offer what we're calling a Word-Filled Women Workshop. It's an interactive workshop in biblical exposition for any woman whose ministry is in any context who wants to make progress in hearing, doing, and sharing a particular sort of biblical literature. This next weekend, we'll take up Old Testament wisdom literature. Every participant has some skin in the game because she's, she comes having completed a preparatory uh, sheet, a preparatory worksheet, and she's coming to, she's done, she's done preparatory work on the very passages that we'll expound together uh, as a group in this workshop. So we're growing to learn how to, to share God's word in our various callings and contexts. For those of you who don't think that your church presently has one or two women who, who'd be able to help lead a workshop like this among your women, I'd encourage you to, to check out the resources of the Charles Simeon Trust. Uh, it has a women's track. Some of you have heard of this before. Some of you may have gone through it. Perhaps a few sisters in your congregation with uh, the support of your local church leaders could check out the Simeon Trust. They have an online track and they also have workshops. And you could perhaps develop a, a two-year plan to get a couple of you trained in biblical exposition so that then you could lead that sort of workshop in your own local congregation, aiming to equip every female saint. I'd also recommend to you uh, in the book, Word-Filled Women's Ministry, Carrie Sandham has a wonderful chapter on training new leaders. That's a helpful resource. This relates to what I want to suggest in terms of that more narrow, focused training for Bible teachers. We uh, want to develop, we, we already have a teaching team in place, I'm just four months in, but we want to think more um, clearly about how to work as a team of teachers. We want to give one another feedback we want to humble ourselves in front of one another. We never want one Bible teacher to rise up who's untouchable. Nobody can tell her. You know, nobody can give her any feedback. No, we're on mission together. So we want to develop feedback forms and give each other ongoing feedback and pray together, keep each other accountable. We want to do this together. These are, these are things that we can do um, to strengthen the training among women. Okay, that was my first comment. It was a long one. Second, if we want to mature in expounding a biblical passage and also discerning how that passage expounds the heart, there's no substitute for a sincere and growing love for people, especially the people with whom we're sharing God's word. 
We aim to be able to say with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 11, that we've not only opened our mouths to declare the truth of God, but we've opened our hearts. We've opened our hearts to those to whom we declare this truth. We see this beautifully and powerfully in the example of the Lord Jesus' teaching ministry. We can tell, can't we, when somebody's sharing God's word with us from a position of loving us, of caring about our maturation, of wanting to serve us and do whatever it takes to encourage us in the gospel. Now, I have a few practical disciplines that help nurture my love for people, but let me just tell you one of them. Before I study a passage in preparation to teach it, I still, I don't type everything. I still use my, you know, pen and paper. I write specific names of a few of the women of the group that I'll be teaching. I write them at the top of the page, representing different life stages, different, different issues. And seeing their names throughout the whole process prompts me to pray for them. It, it helps stretch my imagination and my mind, thinking about how this word that God has spoken is for them. It's to refresh them, to encourage them. And then sometimes it actually prompts me to write word-filled notes of encouragement to them afterwards because I've borne them in my mind and my heart as I've, as I've labored over this passage. This is a, a practical way that, that helps me uh, nurture my love for people. There's, there's no substitute in word ministry for a growing love for people. And third, there's no substitute in word ministry for a sincere and growing love for Christ. Our personal relationship with Christ is the foundation of our application of the gospel in others' lives. We'll only apply God's word with a burning focus if we've come to terms with our own need for God and if we've seen how he meets our needs in the person of his son. So we, we can only teach to the heart if we teach from the heart. That means that one key question we must ask ourselves before we share God's word with, with another person is, have I worshipped God through this passage yet? Has he received my praise here on account of his character and ways revealed in this passage? Has he received my praise? And sisters, if God has not received our worship from a passage, others must not receive our admonition. We've touched on the what, the who, the how of word ministry. <laughs> We've seen that word ministry is a Christ-centered calling. It's every Christian's calling, and it's an expositional calling. Finally, the culminating question, why? <laughs> so let's look one last time together at Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Why engage in word ministry? Because we're confident that it's a fruitful calling. Fruitful to edify the church and fruitful to glorify God. I mentioned that in Colossians 3.16, Paul may be referring especially to the, the mutual teaching and admonishing that occurs among God's people through corporate song in the context of corporate worship. And certainly, we can, we can testify to this, can't we? One of the main ways that the word of Christ takes up residence among us is through our corporate worship of God. As we gather around God's word in corporate worship and we're, we're taught and admonished by the word of Christ, our hearts burst into songs of praise. We've experienced this, haven't we? We know this. Is there any greater joy than seeing Christ in his word and responding to him in worship alongside our brothers and sisters. So what might it look like for me, for you, to grow in our personal word ministry and in the word ministry among women in our local church in terms of word-filled worship? How might we grow in word-filled worship? In the women's Bible study I help lead in, in Memphis, we're wanting to make progress in this area, and we haven't figured it out just yet. <laughs> we're still working hard. But one thing that we're doing to, to try to strengthen our muscles in corporate word-filled worship is that after I expound a passage, we take an extended time in corporate, as a large group, in corporate word-filled prayer, praying 
the very words that we've read, praising God for what he's revealed to us in this passage, confessing our sin of not implementing what he's revealed to us in our passage, and so on and so forth. But we want to pray in the text that we've heard. We want, to, we want that to be our first application step. <laughs> Word-filled prayer. That's something that we're doing in, in Memphis. And I tell you, the reason among many that I love it is that our gatherings culminate in corporate doxology, <laughs> in praising God in light of the passage we've studied. Truly, the, the scriptures cast a robust vision for word ministry's ultimate why, its ultimate goal. This vision spans from creation to redemption to, to new creation, the new heavens and new earth. We, image bearers, have been created to declare the glory of Christ. We're part of this cosmos that exists in order to praise him. We've been created through him and for him. So we live out our creational design as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly by hearing it, doing it, and sharing it. And we've been redeemed for the glory of Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The church's public praise of God is the apex of our mission in this world. It's why we're here. <laughs> this is why God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So we live out our redemptive design as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly by hearing the word, doing it, and sharing it. And sisters, one day soon, we'll see him face to face will be glorified to declare the glory of Christ. Revelation 15 helps us envision what it will be like to worship God in his full unmediated presence. And what are God's people doing in his unmediated presence? They're singing the song of Moses from Exodus 15 to Deuteronomy 32. They're bursting out in word-filled worship Sisters, our word ministry isn't confined to this lifetime. By God's power, all the prayer and hard work and toil that we invest into growing and making progress in our ministry of the word, it will bear everlasting fruit. This is no mere pastime, no mere seasonal hobby. By God's word and by the power of his spirit, he's preparing us and those believers to whom we minister for a lifetime an everlasting lifetime of proclaiming Christ by the power of Christ, with joy in Christ, for the sake of Christ. So let's expand our vision. Let's, let's expand our vision for word ministry among women in our local church and relying on God at every step. Let's get after it for the glory of Christ and the advancement of his kingdom. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I'm overwhelmed by the privilege of knowing your son, the Lord Jesus, and of by your grace becoming like him. I'm overwhelmed by the privilege of letting his word dwell richly among us. Thank you for your many blessings. We ask that you would expand our imagination, help us uh, envision uh, what it might look like to grow as those who hear your word. Do your word and share your word, all for the glory of your son. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen.